I'm not alone. There's also Nuno from Portugal. The small one. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, So first of all, I would like to thank MIS for the support for the last few years, especially you, Doron, and the whole team. It has been an amazing experience for me for the last few years. Um, we're going to talk about the V like everybody did this morning. Um, and I would like to share, together with Nuno, two cases with you that, in, that involve where there was some orthodontic treatment involved together with some surgery. We're going to talk about both parts of the treatment. It's going to be multidisciplinary, orthodontics, plastic periodontal surgery, and prostodontics. So let me try to explain you what happened with the first patient, because I think it's important to understand what can happen to me, to Nuno, and to all of us. Because if you have patients like this with an implant placed when she was relatively young, she's a dentist, uh, female dentist patient, there is some issues. And we cannot ignore the issues long term with these kind of patients. If you look at the x-ray, it looks nice. Bone levels are very acceptable after 10 years. We can see there's a, nothing dramatical. We can see some discoloration of the soft tissue. But if we look at the face, it becomes a little bit different. And we need to remember these <coughs> things happen, and we need to implement the solutions into our daily uh, practice. Because what happens, what do we see, and mostly with women, that the craniofacial changes go on with the age. And we all have these patients who have either contact points opening, either implant restorations getting into infraocclusion. We see in size alleged positioning, shortening, we see gingival margins migrating, and we see thinning of the tissue. And I think it's important to explain you how we solve these cases and how we implement the things that we see 10, 15 years after implant placement into our new concepts like the V concept. There's a few things that we want to discuss. It's both from a prosto point of view and from a surgical point of view. These two studies relate to these issues that we see uh, with these kind of patients. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think uh, Eric just gave a nice highlight of the case, but I believe that it's really important to look at the case, not just intraorally, but to the smile, so our job is to improve the smile. So let's go quickly and analyze this smile. When she came to us, immediately we could notice that in motion, when the patient is talking, there is a, an asymmetry when, the, when she smiles. So it's important to, to remember and to see that when she smiles, one side, the lip goes upper than in the other side. And this causes, of course, this uh, gingival exposure to be more pronounced in one of the sides, as you can see from this picture. Also, because of what Eric mentioned, the implant uh, was the responsible for this lack of eruption. And we can see, when we look to the full composition of the smile, that we have what we call the inverted smile arc, but more pronounced in one side only, as you can easily see here. And of course, the incisal edges, they were not leveled because of all this that was mentioned before. 
So because of this, um, and now that you have a vision about the case, we set some treatment goals because we want to improve the smile. And for this, we focus, of course, in the main complaint of the patient, that was the soft tissue. The soft tissue was with the color that was not pleasant for the patient, so we have to improve this. In addition, the incisors, the anterior teeth, they were not at the same level, causing differences in the gingival margins and the incisor ledges, as I showed before, and we want to improve this as well. Also, on the other side, we had one other tooth, one lateral incisor, that had um, um, restoration that was not really aesthetic, and we plan to change this as well. <clears throat> so, for this, we planned what we call the interdisciplinary treatment plan. What is this? This is a treatment plan that involves the different specialists, and this is the order that we actually followed. We started with orthodontics. I will immediately show you what we did. After, Eric took care of all the rest with the soft tissue graft and the pros uh, part. So what did we do for the orthodontic treatment uh, of this patient? Could we solve it differently? Well, yes, maybe with a veneer, but why to go with a veneer in a situation like this for the central incisor when we can go minimally invasive in few time? So this is what we did. We look at the case and we set this as our goal. We want to extrude one tooth and of course the other one will be done just replacing the crown. So for this we designed what we call the segmented appliance. That it's a segmented appliance design, why? Because we don't want to put brackets in all the teeth. For us it's easier to have brackets everywhere because it gives us some extra control. But when we work together as a team, Eric tells me, please don't change anything else, change only one tooth. And this makes our life a little bit difficult, but we succeeded and this is what I will explain now. We used only two ceramic brackets that were placed in the, these two teeth and we used a cantilever arm. In these two videos you can see what we did. On the left, um, on the left side, you can see the bracket placement, nothing special with this, just for you to see how it works, because many of you are not orthodontists, so you have an idea. And on this side, <coughs> you can see that we are using the brackets already placed, and we are bending the cantilever. And this, we make the difference that we want this tooth to extrude. Well, there are some things that is important to mention, mainly for the orthodontist, that I didn't use, this is a 22 slot, the bracket that was used as anchorage, and if it would be an 18 slot, it would be better, it would be more stable for me. But we were able to achieve what we planned. And of course, we tie very well the, um, the cantilever, not to have any kind of emergency. So this is the final result. It took two, three appointments, two, three months, and we were able to bring the tooth down without having any side effects on the other side. That is the anchorage unit, that is the skeletal anchorage. So we see before the difference that we had and after. And from this view, it's very important to see that we didn't have any occlusal contact and after the treatment, we were able to get this contact. One important thing that should be mentioned here is that when we do any kind of movement, we expect some relapse. In some cases, we have more. In some cases, we have less. But in this case, immediately before the bonding, removing the appliance, we decided to place a gold chain to keep the teeth in place. And in a regular case, it's quite easy because we have the wire on the buckle side and we tie everything to the wire, but in a situation like this, that we have just two brackets, we have to improvise, and this is what I want to show you as a small tip that you can take home. And this is how it looks. It's, we invented this in the moment and it gave some stability enough to give a nice result. Just to finalize this ortho part, I will also give some tips about the debonding. Many times we see cases that the orthodontist takes the bar and removes the excess 
of uh, bonding material from the tooth and it damaged the texture of the tooth. So we did it with um, just with a blade. It takes longer, but we are sure that we are not damaging anything. And of course, we can use the blade for the tooth. Uh, we, can, we can use the, um, the burrs for the tooth that will be uh, later on replaced. And we polish very well. And this is the final result after the orthodontic treatment, as you see from this picture. So now there's a few things that Nunu improved for me. First of all, the, the incisor level of number 21. Secondly, the gingiva level of 21. And more importantly, even by extruding the tooth, he brought the interdental tissue down. So now I will go for the prosthetic part of the treatment. And it's quite straightforward, but it's nice to show you straightforward and simple cases sometimes. So we remove the old restoration. I don't think if you have thin tissue that you should use a titanium grayish abutment. And that's why we were so happy and also pushing so hard to, for, for MIS to produce us, us, for us yellowish abutments and uh, prosthetic components. We changed from titanium to zirconia. Now we know all, all of you know that we have, if we have a conical connection and we have a zirconia abutment and we tighten it, we might encounter some problems. So there is like uh, always a pro and contra. Maybe we will use a zirconia because the color of the tissue will be nicer, but maybe we needed a titanium connector to make it stronger. But if we use a titanium connector, we know from many studies from Jung and from other people that it has an influence on the color. And have a look at the screen now. This is the dark grayish abutment. What is the sense to have a full ceramic crown on top of this? because exactly in the interface between crown and soft tissue, you have a darkish appearance. So if you just replace it by a prefabricated one, you see the color change of the soft tissue. Now you change the color, you will need to add tissue also, because you want the stability and you want to bring the tissue down. So how do we proceed? First of all, if we want to bring the tissue down, it doesn't make sense to prep equal gingival. We just stay with our prep where we would like the tissue to come down. So the pressure is re released at this, at this moment. And you can see the healing after 10 days. The tissue, just by releasing tissue, the pressure is coming down. So now we just need to add some tissue. Adding tissue, you have been able to see in uh, the first lecture from Professor Bichacho and Mirella Ferraro, that in any of these cases, we should probably add tissue. So what we are doing here now is we're going to make an incision at the connective tissue graft, trying to avoid the interdental part because it's very fragile. It's tissue that Nuno brought down in two to three months. I don't want to impinge on the delicate attachment of the fibers to the natural tooth. So we are adding tissue very, very simple way, just semilunar incision. We are taking the graft either from the tuberosity, either from the palate. There's many techniques. The only thing we know is we need to have extra volume. So cementing the crown, the graft stays in place without any suture if you want. If you want to place a suture, that's fine for me, no problem. Healing after a week. What did we create? We created thickness of tissue, but also we mimic the root in the very important part, which is the interface between pros and soft tissue. How does it heal? Very simple. This is three months post-op, and this is four months post-op. Now we will go for final restorations. Now, if we go for final restorations, we need to think about the materials, we need to think about the connector, we need to think about many things. So on the right-hand side, she has an old composite, She's a dentist, she knows we can do better with composite, eventually, but she asked for a minimal veneer on the right lateral. Left one, left lateral is a problem. Why is it a problem? Because it looks very nice now. But now I am in doubt, because it's still a conical connection with a zirconia component. Victor was telling you that you can even see sometimes staining from the friction between zirconia and titanium. You can see many problems like uh, fractures, like screw loosening, so many problems, much more than if you are using uh, a metal connector. So what was the final plan? The final plan was we're gonna make both sides, one crown on the zirconia abutment, one crown screw retained. And all companies start to have these options of dynamic abutments with screw access on the palatal changing 
the insertion axis. Now, you have to remember, you don't change the axis of the screw. You're just changing the possibility of screw from, screwing in from the palatal. But like in this case, it creates like an aesthetic problem, and I will show you immediately why. So Victor Clavijo, that you saw just before us, or two lectures before us, prepped the right lateral, taking impressions. We made one cemented crown, which means cemented on top of zirconia abutment. And the next option was this kind of option. What is the issue? It's a bigger screw than a normal screw. There's still, anyway, you need to get a screw in. So there's a thin wall of zirconia on the buckle. The thin wall of zirconia on the buckle gives you like a low value of your restoration exactly in the very critical part, which is the first millimeter of your final restoration. So first thing we do is we're going to check the form and we're going to check the impact on the interdental tissue that we want to activate on the mesial aspect. So we are trying in our new abutment. Everything looks fine now. OK? Still looks fine. And we are trying to, we are trying to push the tissue in the critical zone. I saw that Victor explained about critical, subcritical. Exactly in the critical zone, we are trying to give some pressure. It's not new. It's from the cervical uh, contouring concept from Dr. Bichacho from already many years ago. So this is what we have now, a screw-retained restoration. Two problems, thin buckle zirconia, which gives you low value because you can see the screw. Second thing, if we have a titanium connector, we are so happy to have the yellowish colored and warm colored titanium components. It gives you just a different color uh, for the final soft tissue. Nice article in the International Journal of Periodontics, uh, Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry and telling, about, telling you how to manage soft tissue. There's critical, subcritical, there's concave and convex. But you need to know where to apply the pressure on the soft tissue. Work from our Brazilian technicians. I will mention their name immediately. And I can see even if this picture looks beautiful and even if they work a lot on texture and line angle position and line angle position even of the abutment, what is the problem? It's the value of the restoration. What happens basically is this. This connector goes in there. So you bring your interface closer to the narrowest or the thinnest part of the soft tissue. And we know from this study that you only do not see some grayish components if there's three millimeter of tissue, of soft tissue. So what is the lesson? The lesson is place your implant on the palatal, augment as much as possible with soft tissue, and try to have a color that is not grayish. So what happened is we didn't use the screw retained, although, like some, a few people said before us, although screw retained probably is much better. It's retrievable. In cases where you place the implant at the age of 22, you can expect to have some infraposition of the future of the crown in the future, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. So it's nicer to have it screw retained. But it's like a balance between aesthetics, function, and retrievability, and the final X-ray. So we explained you a few things <clears throat> that are important to understand the next case. First of all, we, we would like to thank all of them because they, it's not only us, it's a team of technicians and dentists working together in the office in Antwerp. And uh, we are very proud and happy to be able to present the names because without them we would not be able even to present some, something on stage. <clears throat> Let's present you the second case and then the V-concepts com coming in to what we are going to show. This is the case, and it's not an easy guy. He's a young guy, but he wants something a little bit more aesthetic than he has in his mouth now, but really not easy to handle in the, at the start. So what is the first thing I want to do even for myself? It's to have an idea of what, where we're going. There's a few things. There's documentation, there's impressions, and there's like making a design before we start. And the design before we start is our technicians. They look at the slides, they look at the pictures, they look at the video eventually of the face, and they make a design of what would be ideal. And into the design is implemented the white part and the pink part. 
In the design, he already added the tissue that he would like to get on one of the centrals where we have the, uh, the missing tooth. So we are trying in the design, so I remove the old restorations. I can see very nice color. The, the underlying structure is very nice. So for sure, we will go for feldspathic in this case. If it's dark, we will go for zirconia or even to eventually uh, lithium desilicates. We try in, as you see on the right side, we show the patient. I can see there is a problem. What is the problem? The position of the lateral. The position of the lateral doesn't allow me to place a regular platform implant. Always I will be too close to the root. And prosthetically, I'm in trouble. Showing the, the patient now, it's acceptable. But if you look in close up, it's not acceptable. So then we will go and I will call Nuno and say, OK, Nuno, the guy doesn't want brackets on all of his teeth, but I want you to move the lateral like for 1 to 1.5 millimeter to the distal to create space and to allow me to make like a nice uh, functional and aesthetic uh, rehabilitation. Well, this is the moment that our life becomes difficult. When the patient says, I don't want anything, just make the tooth move with magic. So <laughs> this is the point that we have to start talking with the patient. Let's consider some invisible appliance, maybe lingual orthodontics, maybe Invisalign, maybe ceramic brackets. And when we have a situation like this, quite similar comparing to the situation before, when we work as a team, and Eric tells me, don't touch anything else, move just one tooth. So it comes the difficult part, and the only way to do it is with segmented. What, do, did, what you saw in the first case is that we had an implant. So we had a reactive unit that was helping us to, to move the tooth without any side effect. But here, we don't have any implant yet. So you see from this picture nicely that the tooth is on the way and we have to move the tooth distally. Of course, it's not really difficult to move the crown distally, but Eric needs to place an implant there. So he said, please move the tooth bodily. If possible, the root, the apex, slightly distally comparing to the crown. So it means that the mechanics should be a little bit more careful in order to get this in the correct position. So the treatment goals are, as you can see, a movement of 1.5 millimeters, very pre precise request from the periodontist in order to move the tooth and do it bodily. <clears throat> so as I said before, we have to go through a segmented approach. And in this case, we designed an appliance that we called bracketless uh, appliance. Why? Because we created a force system that doesn't need uh, any bracket. What do we need for this? We need a power arm, we need a temporary crown, a mini screw, and a guide. And I will explain you now what we did. We developed this, I, I believe that is new because I never read it before, but the mechanics is well known. It's just a power arm that we apply the line of action of force in a correct place, but we try to do it as invisible as possible. So because we were working with very good technicians, they immediately understood, together with us, how can we build, in this case, what we call the aesthetic power arm in order to make it as invisible as possible. In addition, we used um, the special uh, composite, the, the pink composite, in order to make the hook as similar to the soft tissue, as you can see here from uh, an axe gum. And the planning of the mini screw is very important. And how did we do that? We had a Skype conversation. I was in my clinic in Portugal. Eric was in Belgium. And we were talking um, to the lab in Israel. And we decided exactly where the mini screw should be. Why this is important? Because for Eric, it's easy to say where there is more bone to place the screw. But I know the, the place where the force should be. So we need to really see together. And if there is any compromise in terms of screw position, we have to all discuss as a team again. In order to place the implant in the correct size, we 
ask the lab um, guide for the mini screw, as you can see from the video. First, maybe Eric, do you want to add something to this procedure since you place the screw? No, I think it's sometimes more difficult to do these little things than to place implants. And uh, I think it's unbelievable. We were talking to Louis from M-Guide Center in, in Tel Aviv, and he had a very nice idea. It's like the same kind of access. The diameter of this screw is almost the same access as when you use an M-Guide for full arch pro, uh, implant placement. So I think it's something unique. It's very predictable. I can place, I, can, I know which, what screw. It's called Link, I think, from MIS. It's an orthodontic anchorage. It makes my life easy, like all guided surgery is making my life much more easy now today. So this is how it looks, the aesthetic power arm. You have the crown, that is the temporary crown that we built to hold this hook. There is a metallic structure inside and the mini screw implant with pink composite in order to be as invisible as possible and with a clear uh, elastic chain. Notice this small detail that is really important. When we do segment the mechanics, in general, we use this for big movements because it's not precise. So we had to do in a way that is precise because we want one and a half millimeters. So in this way, we ask the lab, please, just build the crown with the exact space. So this helps us in order to stop in the right uh, position. So what we actually did, it was this movement. We brought the tooth bodily, slightly the apex distally in order to allow Eric to place the implant without any interference on the way. And from the CT, you can see two things. First, we reduce the space as we planned. And second, there is a rotation of the lateral. This is a side effect that could not be avoided because we are applying, we cannot apply the force exactly on the center of resistance of the tooth. We are buckly. So we have this side effect that can be counteracted only with another appliance on lingual, maybe what we call double cable mechanics. But since we are doing a multi an interdisciplinary case that I know that will get a crown, it's not something that would create any problem at the end. So this is before the space we had. We gained the space we expected. And maybe Eric can okay, continue with then, that. Then now Nuno created the space for me to place the implant. When we were planning the orthodontic screw, I was talking to Louis and I could barely place a narrow platform implant because the interincisal canal was too wide, because the root of the lateral was too close. So many, many things that couldn't be done. So the first thing I did is reprep. Reprep, but not reprep subgingival on the lateral. Why? Because I'm going to reshape the, the mesiopalatal part of this lateral just to compensate a little bit for the rotation. And what we see is that after two weeks, the tissue is coming down. It's like creeping of the attachment. So now the, f the space is filling a little bit. Planning, we start to plan. We Skype with Louis in, in Tel Aviv, and we start to plan. We have the STL file of the prep teeth. We have the STL file of the provisional, and we have the CBCT DICOM files. So now it's easy to plan the position of the implant. It's going to be screw retained, much easier, less of a headache. So the position is quite palatal. There is not so too, mu too much bone. You can decide on the length, you can decide on the position, and you can decide on the width. So it's, everything is done in advance. And one thing you need to remember, and it's Nitsan mentioned it this morning also, from this study, we see that if the bone on the buccal aspect of an implant is less than one millimeter of a buccal aspect also of a natural tooth, you don't see it on the, on the CBCT sometimes. And maybe these machines will improve like the micro tomographies, but until now, sometimes you don't see it. M-guide in position is very stable. It's tooth supported, always works. Never had any problem, honestly. If I would have had a problem, I would have tell, told you. So placing the M-guide, now my surgery becomes easy because everything is planned in advance. I just need to take care of the soft tissue. That's all. I can focus on the soft tissue. So implant placement, since 2012, January, we were using, I am using the first prototypes from 2012, January. 
We placed a considerable number of implants, V3 implants, in all clinical indications. This is just one indication. It allows me to get the flat surface to the buckle, but especially it allows me to have the triangular part to the palatal, which allows me to get better blood supply and more soft tissue, and which will be better on the long run. Other side, place the connective tissue graft. This is the healing. After 90 days, I will go in again. We can reshape prosthetically the zenith of the lateral. That's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is how are we going to restore prosthetically now? This patient needed like canine guidance to be restored. We left the lateral right side as it is. It was the natural tooth. Of course, I'm place, I can place a veneer, but I think if nature gives you this kind of tooth, I think it would be pity to prep it. So we made our life a little bit more difficult. This is what we see, and if we transfer the form, it shows you that on the palatal aspect where the blood supply comes from, most of the blood supply comes from the palatal. If by design we create more soft tissue and more vascularity from the palatal, everything will be uh, better. The healing will be better. Many things will be better. Discussion. Closed tray or open tray? We are using today most of the time closed tray. Why? Because I'm able to connect the replica, especially for the conical connection, extra, extra impression. If you have a closed tray, you need to connect it into the impression. It's different. So we are using a lot of the closed tray, uh, impression copings, checking the fit, very important for all systems, not only MIS system. And this is probably something that we developed recently, the last few years, with the Brazilian technicians. Comes from the cervical, cons the cervical contouring concept, the CCC from Nitsan. It's just applied to implants in a, maybe a little bit of a different way. We make the ideal wax up. We are not playing with provisionals anymore. Doesn't make sense in our eyes to spend time, energy, and money in adding some flow, removing, adding, pressurizing. If we have the optimal wax up with the ideal transition between white and pink, and if we take a silicone index from this wax up and we press it against the model, this will give us the ideal outline, the ideal meeting point between pink and white parts. So Cristiano Soares made this case. What do I like about the system? The yellowish components, the fit of the components, this is very, very important for me. So we used a tie base, 1.5 millimeter gingival height, allowing for concavity and soft tissue thickness. And from there on, we go to the blue line on the model which has been designed. Trying in the abutment, since we are going to place ceramic crowns on the central and on the left lateral, and minimal veneers on the canines, which Victor Clavicio prepared. We want to try to have everything almost the same color. So the abutment has been ceramized, has a different color, looks like a prep tooth. And on the buckle aspect, you can see that it supports the soft tissue exactly like on the natural tooth. We want to copy nature. We want to be, in a biological way, we want to be able to copy nature. This is how it looks. It looks a little bit weird. It's a titanium base, bonded zirconia crown veneer on the buckle. So that's how it looks. This is how it looks intraorally. We need some maturation of the tissue for sure, but when you see where we started, is it perfect? No, no. Did we improve a lot? Yes. Did Nuno help me a lot? Yes. How could we plan everything? Probably the guided things and the impressions. And of course, having technicians, dental technicians like Hilal and many other guys who, who understand what we are doing uh, clinically into our office. Final X-ray. What we see is that if we keep the cement space of the zirconia to the titanium connector away from the bone, we get long-term bone stability. Not only because of this, but also because we create space for the connective tissue to seal off the external environment from the bone, or seal off the bone from the external environment. So if, if we have a prosthetic concept, and if your technician knows what he's doing, and if the surgeon knows what he's doing, and if he, if he can plan in, in advance and guide the surgery, nothing is difficult. Nothing is really difficult. So 
I think we are too early, but I want to show you this one. And I promised the guy I would always show you. In any meeting, big 2,000, 5,000 or two people, I don't care. But I think clinical reality sometimes is a little bit different. Because this is my friend Biral from Brazil. When I stay in Brazil on holiday, I most of the time try to meet him. He has a different objective and he has a different way of treating patients because this is the chair. There is no rotary instruments. There is no papilla height and no zirconia and no titanium stuff. This is his suturing material. His, his son is a fisherman and he has a hook of a, to fish and he puts some floss. And he sutures as nicely as we do. The only thing is, that's the view of the office. What I want to say is probably, probably what we are showing you or what you are doing in the office is one thing, but the reality in most part of the world is completely different. And I probably appreciate a lot what he's doing and I learned a lot from him. And I think uh, most of us should be more zen like he is and enjoy life. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nuno.